Listen carefully to this statement. It's just three words. Four words. Sorry. <laughs> you think I'd be able to add <coughs> properly. Discernment is our obligation. Let's close in prayer. All right. Cool. Right? Discernment is our obligation. We always pray for discernment, but do we even truly understand what discernment is? Do we understand that it is not something that is just a gift that we can ask for and learn and grow in, but it's an obligation? It's something that the Lord offers to us, but expects us to take it. Expects us to learn it. Expects us to understand it. Expects us to operate in it. I want to read a couple of verses. I, I was with the Lord this morning asking what he wanted. And that was the thought he gave me. Discernment is your obligation. And so I said, Lord, just take me to some verses to begin to paint a picture of what this looks like. Because, see, I think we get discernment and something else mixed up. So let's, let's, uh, let's just look at a couple of verses. And, and you could turn to the, I'm going to read a couple of verses first. You don't have to turn to these. I'll tell you where they are, or you can First one is Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. You've heard all these. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And the first key that he showed me was having a heart ready to understand what discernment is. Right? In, in building a relationship with the Lord, you have to have a heart posture to even do that. If you meet a, a, a person that is potentially going to become your friend and you're going to build a relationship together, you have to have a heart posture to do that, to open yourself up. Because what is relationship except that it's making ourselves vulnerable? When you build a relationship with especially a spouse, there's nobody humanly on this earth that I am more vulnerable with than Alexis. And it's because of building that relationship that over time we have learned to trust each other in that relationship. Now, neither of us are perfect. So you can imagine how much easier it is, in many ways, to build relationship with the Lord when you can rely on the perfection of Him. Only one we have to figure out is us. <laughs> and we let him do that. But you have to have this posture of understanding who that person is. And what it talks about here in terms of the fear of the Lord, I think is the beginning of understanding that posture. You know, in today's especially culture, youth culture, whatever you want to call it, in so many ways we have become lax in how we recognize the father, the man upstairs, the, the you know, my bro that's up there, whatever. Just having this vernacular that takes away the very fear of who he is. And I don't mean afraid like, don't hit me, don't hit me. I don't mean, that's, that's not the kind of fear that the Bible's talking about here. It's talking about the awe of understanding who he is. <clears throat> See, the Bible says he is who created you. And as the potter, doesn't he have the right to do with the clay what he wants? It says, <laughs> says, doesn't he have the right that it, if it's messed up to put it all back into a lump again and begin reforming it. He has that right. The fear is understanding that he has that right. The fear is understanding that as the creator, he, we owe him everything. 
And then understanding what Jesus did on the cross, we then owe him everything. Because he also is the creator. The triune God. But the fear of the Lord is recognition of his holiness. See, he can't just be your bro. He can't just be this cool friend that you go to when you're in trouble. That you reach out to and say, Lord, I can't handle this part, this other stuff, I, I got this. But this other part of my life I can't quite handle, so why don't you just come alongside me and help me with this? While the entire time it's really, why don't you come alongside of me? And I'll let you about this close. Because I need your help. See, the fear of the Lord is recognizing that he purchased that last three feet. He purchased every part of me. Every part of you. He purchased that by the mere words that he spoke that created you in the first place. Jesus purchased you with every drop of blood gave when he gave his life so the fear is understanding that to go to him first is understanding who he is the righteousness of who he is Moses when he approached the burning bush and knowing that it was God what did the Lord say take your shoes off take your sandals off Respect the holiness of his presence. It wasn't about the dirt that he was on there. It was about the atmosphere that God was engulfing to speak with him. So if you want to know the wisdom of God and you want to understand the discernment of God, you've got to first Understand he is holy. And we cannot go to him with no intention in our minds of repentance. I'm not saying you have to go to him already holy. Because <laughs> you can't. If he is the holy maker, we can't become holy first and then go to him. We can't. But there has to be a posture in our hearts of repentance saying, Lord, I recognize you are the only one who can make me holy because you are holy. And so as David said in Psalm 139, show me anything, anything in me that has become a barrier that keeps me from you. See, that is recognizing the holiness of God. That is the fear of the Lord. And it said that's the very beginning of knowledge. That's the very beginning of wisdom. You have to have that as a predetermined place in your life before you can even begin to understand the things of God. Now, I, I want to point out here the difference between discernment and wisdom because they can get mixed up really easy and then with wisdom you have godly wisdom and you have human wisdom right wisdom is a gathering of knowledge in in the capability of being able to apply toward a certain outcome being able to understand that if I place my hand into a fireplace, it's going to burn. Okay, the wisdom of understanding what happens when you do things, the outcome of what, of what comes from that. That is wisdom, that's human wisdom. That's, that's not hard to figure out. Just go put your hand in a fireplace. I mean, when it's burning. <laughs> You'll figure it out pretty quick, right? We, we all have learned lessons like that. That's not godly wisdom. It's not discernment. It's very different. 
See, if they were the same thing, then Solomon never would have failed. In fact, Solomon, the Bible says, is the wisest man that there ever was. Ever will be, perhaps. I think it said that. But yet in his wisdom, he was a supreme failure. Do you understand? At the end of his life, he was a supreme failure in relationship with the Lord. Because in his human wisdom, he didn't see the pitfalls of not listening to what God had said in marrying foreign women. Not even marrying extra women, but foreign women. Because that was one thing that was told of him not to do. Don't marry foreign women. So that human wisdom didn't stop him. Now, did he understand maybe through the human wisdom? I don't know. I can tell you if he had discernment, he would have seen. Discernment would have shown him the cost of that relationship between he and the Lord, the cost of what that would be by doing what he did. And yet, he was the wisest man there ever was. And I'm not saying human wisdom is not good. It's important. It's important to learn not to put your hand into the fireplace. It's important to learn how we move throughout life and the choices God gives us. How to drive a car. You know, it's, it's pretty wise not to drive out into traffic when the light is red. It's a wise choice not to hit the gas, right? Uh, okay, that, that seems pretty obvious, right? To at least most of you. Right, but that's not what we're talking about this morning. Because, see, even the world can understand wisdom. Even the world can be taught good choices. What we're talking about is discernment. Something I'm afraid that the bride has not had for a long time. Because discernment is something that is seen in a world that we cannot see. It has to be layered with a base foundation of faith in the first place. Let me read another, another verse to you. you. You guys know this one too. I, I would get this every year on my birthday card from my grandmother. Right? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. He'll make your path straight. Don't lean to your own understanding. So he said, first to begin with, you have to have this awe of who God is and understand who he is. That's imperative. But then... To that, you have to add on the fact that you cannot rely on your own thought process. I don't see any cars coming. I know it's a red light, but I don't see cars coming. Pull out, smack. Sometimes when we lean on our own understanding, we reap massive failure because we don't see everything. We don't recognize everything. And yet God's saying, man, if, if you ask for discernment and build a relationship with me and I give you discernment, you'll see everything. You'll see that car that's around the corner that you don't see right now that's coming at 80 miles an hour. Right? You'll discern. Why? Because discernment is of the Holy Spirit. I do want to turn to the next one the Lord took me to. And that is James chapter 1. So in understanding this pursuit of discernment, we first understand that we have to have an awe of who God is and a recognition of his holiness, a recognition of his love. That's a tough one, by the way. 
I'm going to say 99.9999999% of the bride that I have met with that don't understand relationship, it's because they don't know how much they're loved. They don't know how important they are to Jesus. How important they are to God. Why God would even give his own son for them. I, I would imagine there are many in this room that struggle with that. Struggle with that love that he has. With accepting that love. Because see, in a human thought process... Our acceptance of love somehow is because we deserve the love. See, I accept the love from my wife because I deserve it. Because I, I give love back and we've, we've put in 30, what is it, 31, 32? I don't know. I think, I think we're going on 32. Pretty sure. 33? No, it's not 33. It's, I think it's 32. Beth says 32. Well, she's right. <laughs> she's right. Yeah, it was 88. We were born in 88. Not born. We were born as a couple in 88. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, I'm going to derail myself totally. No, but the point is, I forgot my point when I went into that. That you deserve it. Yeah. That's right, thank you. We do not think that we deserve God's love. And guess what? We don't. We don't deserve his love. That's just the basic truth of it. We don't deserve it. But we get it. It's offered to us on a platter. His love was offered through the death of his son and the resurrection of his son made that love possible. See, you don't have to recognize that you deserve it, but you do have to receive it. Love offered is not love engaged until it is received. God can love you for eternity, which he does and he will. It doesn't mean you will recognize it. It doesn't mean you'll feel it. It doesn't mean that it will be an encompassed part of your life until you receive it. That's why everything begins with love. To even understand relationship with him, you have to understand how much he cares for you. And you don't even have to understand a lot. Because that's what he shows you in relationship. Time and time again, as you're building this relationship with him, he's showing you, wow, see? See why I love you? Here, here's another reason I love you. Here's another piece why I love you. This is what I did for you. This is, this is how special you are to me. And, and if we were to go here and, and raise hands, everybody would raise their hand to that. That yes, as, as I built relationship with him, he's shown me how desperately in love with me that he is. James chapter 1, we're going to begin at verse 2, says this, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And this is really where I want to get to, because it, it, it lays out the goal in verses 2 through 4. It lays out the goal of this perfect patience. That's really what steadfast is. It's, it's patience. It's the ugly P word. And for it to take its full effect is the goal. To be perfect and complete, lacking nothing in our lives. Not materially, but in our relationship with him. 
lacking nothing, lacking nothing in love, lacking nothing in recognizing who you are and the value of who you are and why your choices for your own life make a difference. Lacking nothing and complete and perfect. Then, beginning in verse 5, it goes into telling you how. Verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generous, generously to all without reproach. Do you know what that means? That means no matter what you've done in your life as a Christian, when you have, have failed horribly, and then go back to God and say, God, just give me wisdom in this. Help me, help me in this choice. Help me to recognize truth here. What it means is God will give liberally without saying, oh, okay, this is going to go to waste. <laughs> he doesn't do that. In fact, what he does is he gives and he goes, come on. Come on, you got this. You got this. Because you got me with you. if it would stop right there. But it doesn't. See, it gives a parameter. It says in verse 6, but let him ask in faith. No doubting. When you ask the Lord, you ask in faith. You don't doubt in what he will do and what he can do in relationship with you. Because he says, for the one who doubts, like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. That person must suppose that he will not receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Probably the saddest thing beyond saved, not saved. The saddest thing in the bride is to see those people that are tossed all over the way the wind blows. And you're seeing it right now. Because God is forcing choices in the bride. He's forcing literally the, the relationships to be exposed. But by the way, do you know? Because I, I, know, I know a lot of people that, that are online and they, they mock at this idea of relationship. Do you know, no matter what, you have a relationship with the Lord? No matter what. If you, accepted, if you have accepted Jesus Christ into you, your heart, you are sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. You are sealed until you receive the promise, which is heaven. You have a relationship immediately with God. Why? Because you're tied together. You're tied. He's the one... Who tied the knot? You can't untie it. He tied the knot. Okay, you already have a relationship with him. Doesn't mean it's a good one. It doesn't mean it's a fun one. Doesn't mean it's a loving one. How many relationships do you know, even of marriages, that are so much worse than if they didn't have the relationship at all? I know, I know many. I'm sure most people in here do. Just because you have relationship doesn't mean it's a good one. It takes that investment. It, take, it takes what it says here, that faith in believing Him. Believing Him for who He is. Believing Him when He says, I love you. I love you no matter what. I love you when I pour my love out for you that cost the very life of my son. That's the love he has. We have to believe that by faith. As we begin to believe this by faith and build this foundation of who, who we are and who we understand him to be, then we can have that faith that plows. You ever see those icebreakers, the icebreaker ships, they are the most amazing ships. If you ever watch those, because 
what is there, not, not just as they go through the sea. I mean, you, you know, you watch that. That's amazing enough to see some of these, big, like a big destroyer moving through the ocean. You know, you look at the old World War II destroyers and they actually come to a point. They cut through the water so beautifully. But see, when you get to ice, there's barrier there. But these ice ships, they go through and they just plow right through this ice. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. But see, that's what faith does. Faith will plow through the things that would stop normal people. Right? Not every ship can do that. Not every ship can, I mean, not every ship can go through the normal ocean. But not every ship can certainly go through ice, certainly go through the very blocks that are there to stop ships. But an icebreaker can. And it's cool to see them because if you watch, uh, it, it, I, I saw one of those, what are they called where you take like the film a whole day and break it down into like 30 time seconds? Time lapse, yeah. Saw a time lapse of this and it was, it was really, really cool where you see him break the ice and it, it's just like this open water right behind him and then behind that it's just refreezing. <laughs> and, and, you know, they can't go backwards because they can't break the ice backwards. They can only break it forward. So what forms behind them is this barrier that has nothing to do with them. doesn't stop them. The ice doesn't stop them. When we have faith in the Lord and what he wants to do, you will not be stopped if you are doing his will. doesn't mean you can choose to do whatever you want and you won't be stopped. That's not what a relationship is. If, if, I, if I wanted to do something, I'm in relationship with Alexis, but, but say that I wanted to go on a vacation and didn't care what she thought about it. Okay, first of all, that probably wouldn't work out so well. Right? We have to be in tuned with what we're doing together, especially something, some, and that's probably a bad example, because... Like, you, you wouldn't want to go to Alaska fishing with me, right? <laughs> Maybe that's a bad example. But see, when the core direction of our marriage is decided by one, if I were to decide that, and that's not something that she wanted, it's going to cause friction. It's no different with the Lord. When you build relationship with Him, and then you begin to choose things that are not of him. Whether they're good or bad doesn't matter. Because he has specific pathways for you in your relationship with him. And when we begin to pick on our own, through our own desires, our own lusts, it begins to cause friction in that relationship. Not friction because of God. Friction because of me. Friction because of what my desires are different than his. But when our desires begin to line up with his and we move forward in his, there is this faith built. And this is the point I, I, I want you to understand. Without faith, we can't please him. You know that. Hebrews 11 says. Everything wraps around faith. Your relationship with him wraps around faith. Stepping in the faith that he gives you to build upon. Not just, here's your portion of faith. Good luck with that. See you in heaven. It's not what God does. He says, Here, here's, here's a portion of faith you're gifted with. Let's see what you do with it. Let's see what you do with this faith. See if you step forward in this faith when it's going to be scary to step forward. Knowing that it's with him, but still, it's scary. It's difficult. It's a difficult choice because everybody's saying not to do it, except God. Boy, isn't that the story of Ignition Church? Everybody says this, that, and the other. 
But you know what? It shouldn't matter what they say. And praise God, I think to most it doesn't. Because it only matters what God says. When the bride gets that, when the bride understands that they are subject to God in that, you will see a unification of the bride that you have never seen ever, ever, ever. Because remember, even in the inception of the church, once it went from that 120 on that very same day went to 3,120, there was not alignment. There was alignment in the gospel. There was not alignment in the purpose. And you begin to see that over time where Satan comes in and tries to pull people in their own lusts, their own desires, and infiltrate those people into the church. Well, God wants unity in his bride. He has said that. He is going to get it. Oh my goodness, what it will look like. I can tell you the base of, of where that's going to come from is what it says right here. Faith. When you ask for discernment, as for recognizing what's going on that you cannot see, recognizing a spirit on someone or something or a choice, you have to, by faith, not only ask that, but faith, receive it. Why? Because you can't see. Unless you're given a gift of sight, which, by the way, was only given through faith anyways. Shannon, were you given your gift of sight because you didn't believe? No, it was out of belief. It was out of faith. The very gifts that we're given that activate in our lives, which, by the way, you are given gifts the moment you accept Jesus Christ as Savior. You have been given gifts. Everybody in here has been given gifts. Those gifts will not, never will be activated outside of faith. They can't be. Because without faith, we're unstable. Without faith, we're tossed. We're God, Satan, God, Satan. You know, the little two guys on your shoulder, right? We're tossed in our thinking, even as to what we think is right. That's why the bride's so screwed up right now. Just turn on Facebook and have a look. You'll see. It's sad. Because, why? Because they can't see to discern the truth. Discernment is not only the most important thing in a Christian's life, outside of salvation, but it is critical in the battle right now to take back what is God's. I remember, and, and, and the bride has just been notorious for this. I remember as a kid, and you all knew how I grew up and stuff, and I remember as a kid, all the people that would say bad things about Billy Graham. I mean, now, now in this culture, Billy Graham's like, oh, yeah, he's awesome, it's all good. Well, when I grew up, Billy Graham was rebellious. <laughs> wow. You know, but that's exactly what has happened to the bride. We won't talk with him. We won't work with him because he doesn't believe the same doctrine that we do. So we're just going to go back into our hole and wait until hell just takes everything and the Lord finally takes me home. In Jesus' name. <laughs> How sad for you. How about if the Lord just take you? And I mean that. Get you out of the way. Because that is not today's bride. That is not what the Lord wants. He wants unity. 
Is there a right and a wrong in doctrine? Absolutely. Don't come to me for it. Here's an idea. Go to Jesus. He just said right here, if you ask, he'll tell you. He'll send his Holy Spirit and he'll tell you, but how many that have sent me emails, that have sent me texts and everything else, how many of them truly, and, and I'm asking you this, how many times have you gone to your prayer closet and asked the Lord, is this true? Is this true? Lord, give me an open heart to receive if it is from you. Take away the pride in my religious thoughts and traditions if they're blinding me. And guess what? He'll do that. If your heart is really to receive that, he'll do that. I know because he did it with me. That's exactly what I did. Not believing any of this stuff. Not believing in the power of the Holy Spirit as I know it now. Believing in the massive love that he has for me. But I went into my room, locked myself away, and I said, Lord, I just feel in my heart that you're trying to tell me something. I don't know what it is because it's so different than what I've heard my whole life, than what I've understood my whole life. It's so different. But if this is you, I want it. I lay my own quirks, my own fears, my own trepidation down at your feet, and I say, I want the truth. See, if one of my daughters were to come to me and just say, I, I just need to know the truth in this. I just want the truth in this. Do you not think I'm going to share with you? If their heart is yearning for truth, I will share with them the truth. How much more Will God share with us the truth of who he is and how he wants to operate and build relationship with you when we come to him in sincerity and say, I want it. I will set aside everything because I don't want to be tossed. I don't want to be a person with a lack of faith. You know, if, if faith is what pleases God, the bride is very unpleasing right now. Now only you can answer for yourself where you stand in your faith, in your trust of who he is. Because what he's calling for today what he's calling for in this time is discernment. And he's not asking. He's expecting. He's expecting you to be discerning. Not to rely on your spouse. Not to rely on your parents. Not to rely on your work. Not to rely on your pastor. He is asking you to draw close to him so he will give you discernment. So you can take your rightful place. The membership of the bride, that peace that can't be filled by anybody else. This is a call to intimacy. Because you have a part to play. Everybody here does. Everybody in the bride does. It doesn't mean you'll pick it up and run with it. That's the call today. Will you have the faith? Will you first 
recognize the awe of who God is and the holiness of who he is? And then will you pour the faith into asking him, give me discernment. Help me to see when I have an opportunity come before me or a choice come before me. Help me to see the spirits behind that choice. Help me to see what's in operation as I walk into a place that you have called me to. Help me to see it. Help me not to resort back to human wisdom. Resort back to figuring out it out in my head. But help me to know it because of the intimacy that I have with you. He is calling us to discernment. Will we answer that call? I can tell you who will. The ready bride. They will answer the call. Because it's important to them. In fact, there's nothing more important to them. Let's come on up. We do so need wisdom and discernment, um, but we need the wisdom of God and the discernment of God. And don't forget that the, um, get this straightened out here, not to be confused with the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is discerning of spirits. That's a little bit different. And it is important for people filled with the Holy Spirit to know what spirit is at play. Is it the human spirit? Is it a demonic spirit? Is it the Holy Spirit? And we need to have God's wisdom to discern what spirit is taking place. But you know one thing that hit me, I just wanted to mention this when he was talking about the division in the bride. You have to go back sometimes to the fundamentals. And one of the things that's kind of a fundamental, I think I'm just going to hold this because this stand is just not doing so great here. Um, Sometimes you have to go back to the foundational greatest commandment, which is what? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. If you really, if you really have an open heart to seek God and love him with every fiber of your being, but then with that cup filled and that love for him, you, it spills out into loving others, then even if, there's a misunderstanding, even if there's something spoken about by someone that claims to be a brother or sister in Christ, that love for them is going to want to make you first get a clear understanding of where they're coming from before the judgment and the writing off. How often we dismiss or based on a soundbite determine that a pastor or preacher or evangelist or someone that we know is in the wrong without knowing their heart, without knowing um, the context of which they said a particular point. And so oftentimes, and, and even today, I was just thinking, there could be an easy mistake, because I know that Greg has said in the past, if you're only just accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, that's not relationship. And yet today he said, you have relationship as soon as you get saved. But yeah, but it's the context. He's talking about a developed, the, the actual... Wikipedia, whatever definition of relationship, is that point of connection, and that's what he was speaking of today. But yet we know also the definition of relationship is building an ongoing communion with that person and it deepening. So it's so easy to take things out of context. 
and then decide that that person is in a camp of ungodliness or denying something of truth. But if you love them, if you love your neighbor as yourself and you love the Lord, you're going to find those things out. And you're going to intercede on behalf of them out of love because in our love for one another, we pray for each other. And these are things that have to be part of our our laid down walk, you know, to get the wisdom of God, to get the discerning of spirits, to get discernment comes from a humility that says, I no longer am going to lean on my own judgment. How often do we judge with very limited understanding? See, discernment is the ability to judge well, whereas discerning of spirits is that Holy Spirit release of what spirit is at play. All of it, though, requires us looking to God and looking outside of ourselves. And it does take that faith. It does take that humility and that surrender. And that's where, I said in the ladies' class this morning, um, it's so true that uh, a hardened heart, an unsurrendered hardened heart, will lead to ignorance in the mind. It will lead to a dullness, uh, if you will, a stupidity, where people cannot see. And then you think, well, how in the world are you making those decisions? How in the world are you coming up with that? How in the world are you supporting that and unable to see what's really going on? There is a blindness that happens. Jesus made that clear to the disciples. He said, be careful how you hear. But because you believe me and you hear well, more understanding will be given. But the fact that you're not hearing well to those that do not, what little they have will be taken from them. That's a scary thought. And yet we see it all the time. We see that what we thought was a, was a, a wisdom and a basic understanding of Christian pin- principles are just flying out the window. And we're like, what happened? What happened to these people? What happened to the compromise, the complacency, the dullness? And if I dare say, the stupidity that's rampant in the bride. It's because in order to get the true wisdom, not just the wisdom that if conformed to this world, instead of laid down Romans 12, 1 and 2 as a living sacrifice to God and allowed to be renewed in the, in the spirit of our minds in Christ Jesus, when we just are in the, in the human realm, what you think is common sense, and I, I've heard a lot of people say this phrase, you know, common sense is not all too common anymore. And it's because there is a deceiver. There is a spirit at play. The demonic spirits. There is a war in the spirit like no other. There is psychological warfare like no other. And it is coming. Psychological warfare is a constant repetition and barrage of the same thing, the same lies over and over like this echo chamber, hoping to just wear you down and dull you down. And it is only in the truth, walking and abiding in the truth, that you're set free from that. And recognizing what's at play, what's going on here. And as you are navigating through your own Christian walk, and you're seeking the Lord, saying, Lord, every morning, I'm telling you, every morning I say, God, get my head straight. Get my thoughts in line with you. I want the mind of Christ. I don't want my own understanding Because, you know, if you live long enough, you kind of think that you figured out that A plus B equals C. Not in the kingdom, it doesn't. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Kingdom ways do not add up the ways of this world do. We've got to have the wisdom. That's why common sense really adds up to a whole lot of nothing. It might help you keep your hand out of a human fire, but it will not help you keep your hand out of a spiritual fire in the sense of danger. If you are not relying on God and he has set it up that way because he wants to be everything to us. That's how much he loves us. He wants to be our wisdom. He wants to be our discernment. It's so much easier when the, when the Lord says, give me your burden, take my yoke, take, take my burden. Cause it's easier. He's saying, Hey, bring your junk to me. I just do it my way. It's so much easier. I will give you rest. I will give you a rest, a knowing, this active place of knowing that I can be your all in all. And uh, that's the faith that we've got to have. And there is there is a readiness. We were speaking this morning um, and, and at the beginning of class, 
You can actually see the door is not quite closed. Every day we wake up and there's still the grace of God in terms of a chance of, of this opportunity to believe before the, before the Lord will spew the lukewarm out of his mouth because that is coming. That is his grace every day. But for the first time, again, if you're discerning in the spirit, you can actually see the door beginning to close. It's a frightful thing. And if you're, if you're able to discern above the fray of all the circumstances and recognize what is at play, what is at play, what is at stake in the spirit realm, the discernment of the, and the wisdom of God, what is at stake in this election? What is it about? And is it important for people that have never even been interested in politics? It's important for every human being that lives in a territory, that that territory be ruled by righteousness and holiness of the God that they say they believe. Amen. It's important for everybody. It's not, a, it's not a political, ah, I'm into it, I'm not. Do you understand what is really happening? Or are you deceived by the ways of this world? See, God is saying, wake up, wake up. No more lukewarm, no more riding the line, saying that you believe this, but then living like this, and nobody really holds me to an account. No. The decision is now. The time is now. And, and we want that. We want that. We want people held accountable. Why? Because Jesus came to set the captives free. There are people captive. He came to, set, to bring freedom. And truth, John 8, 32, brings freedom. When you know the truth, it will set you free. And what is truth? It's Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So God is he's bringing this great awakening for this billion soul harvest and he wants relationship with us he wants it and it's exciting yes things are ominous and looking incredibly challenging but man when you wake up and you rest in him bring your burdens to him the burdens of what you see every day on the news what you see of your liberties here in this nation shutting down every day and all these problems bring them to god god is the breakthrough and when you are willing to obey the mandate of his, he, he's, he's asking us to step into the breakthrough he wants to bring through us. As that obedience comes and that faith operates in that obedience, guess what? You're going to find your own personal breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough. Mm -hmm. That's what obedience does. Complacency and lukewarm is just going to get you spit. And so this is a really important time, but yet an exciting time. It all depends on the lens through which you see it. God is always good. He's always good. And his goodness and his holiness, um, when you see through the wisdom that he gives us in discernment, will open your eyes to see that truth. Let's pray. Father, thank you, God, for this important reminder, God, that, that if, if nothing else is taken, let us, let us take t from today even the depth of the Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 verses that Greg read. That are that we lean not on our own understanding, but trust you with all of our heart. Sometimes we get so familiar with your word that we don't allow it to just land on us as the manna in our starving, starving souls to feed us and give us this day our daily bread. God, you give us something every day to just feed on. You give us water that, that will... Quench a thirst that the world cannot quench. God, I just pray that you'd give us this um, greater strength of our faith to trust you and lean not on our own understanding and remember these words. God, we just love you. We praise you, God. We want you to receive all the glory. All the glory, God. You created us for your glory. You are worthy of us giving you everything. What choices we make in this world and all the desires of, of our heart and plans of our life and our work and relationship and family and money making, all these things, God, are, are all just the, the side effect, the side things of the first most important thing, which is that you are preeminent. You are the Lord of our life. And our assignment in this realm is only what you give. If it's really true that we live and we move and we have our being in you, then God, let every part of our life reflect that. What job we take, don't take, whether we get schooling, our, our family choices, our relationships, marrying, 
All these things, God, let these things be a result of following you because we seek you first. God, I just pray for a greater wisdom and an awakening of your bride. God, I pray. We sang in a worship song earlier today that those online didn't get to enjoy with us. Wake us up. Wake us up. Holy Spirit, wake us up. Let us see your kingdom and your righteousness. And as Matthew 6.33 reminds us at the end of that verse, then all these things, the things will be added unto us. You know what we have need of before we even ask. We just seek you first, God. I just pray that awakening, God. People are hurting and suffering and in such need of something so far beyond themselves. They've always needed it, but God, you're shaking. You are shaking all things as we know it. But God, oh God, you are also shaking doors open before us. You are also shaking a pathway, God, for your people to be ready. Help us to heed that call this morning, God. We praise you. We give you, Lord Jesus, all the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen.